It's an honor to be with you today. Our topic is freedom from rejection. Hey, here's the news. Rejection is an epidemic. We've just lived through a pandemic. Rejection is more widespread than COVID. And it's not about a single season of your life. It will touch every season of your life. We need to know how to overcome that, how to flourish in spite of it and not forfeit our future. With the help of God's word and the presence of his spirit, we can be free today. Enjoy the lesson. You know, our topic, we started a week ago talking about war in heaven and war on earth. And that this really is a discussion about spiritual conflict and the consequences of that. I think we struggle a great deal to imagine or understand what spiritual conflict looks like. Uh, we think of it in terms of something that is dramatic or overt. And I, I think spiritual conflict is a great deal like physical health. But by the time it breaks open and becomes apparent, it has progressed to a point that it's significant. And we want to become aware enough of what's happening that we engage in the spiritual world around us before it breaks into those desperate places. So I want to plant a seed. In fact, I want to give you an assignment if you'd be willing to accept it. I want to ask you to begin to use the freedom and liberty that you have as a platform from which to share your faith. It's unfortunate we've been coached that our primary expression of faith is attending a worship service. And I believe there's value in that. I go to a lot of worship services. But I don't imagine that that's the ultimate expression of my faith. I think it's my Christianity beyond a worship service that is most significant, and so is yours. Whether it's in the context of let's pray and you share prayers with other people in, in an open and a willing way, whether it's you talk about biblical values when you're with friends, it starts at the kitchen table. You gotta be willing to bring your biblical worldview into the discussions with your family. Sometimes it's awkward, sometimes it's uncomfortable, sometimes it's challenging, but it's necessary. You see, it's completely illegitimate. If we're unwilling to have a conversation around our kitchen table about the values that we hold, then to imagine that some leader, some pastor, some elected person, some party, some anyone else would lead in a godly way if we lack the courage to bring those biblical values to our kitchen table. We have to start there. I understand that's one of the most difficult places in the world to be a Christian. But if you can do it there, then when you go to the ball fields, the soccer fields or the baseball fields or whatever sport the kids are involved in this week, have those conversations with the parents. You share some common values and activities. Your kids are engaged together. Talk to them about your worldview. Talk to them about the values that you hold. Talk to them how you understand marriage or family. Have the courage to bring your faith forward in your life. It's important. We've got to overcome the tendency, and it's been one widely practiced and often encouraged in the church. What if we offend someone? Folks, if you're a UT fan, you could care less who you offend. In fact, you look for opportunities. I turned on the radio one day this week, and there was some talk show going on, and they were talking, they've already won the national championship. I was like, well, good. It's good to know. Help with betting. I'm kidding. <laughs> but, but don't just passively blend in. Have the courage to become an ambassador for Jesus. Amen. Will you at least pray about that? There's a reason why I think that's so important. If we don't use our liberty and freedom as ambassadors, we will lose it. There are changes taking place. They haven't happened in the last month or the last year or the last two years. It's not about a politician or a particular party. This is much bigger than that. But there is an attitude, a spirit of authoritarianism that is stalking our streets. It's growing in strength. And it will only be turned back by a vibrant, vital, alive church. It's not a political movement that we need. We need a spiritual change. And the church is the delivery system of that. As I have prayed for the last few weeks, this has become increasingly intense in my heart. And I thought maybe I had misunderstood the definition, so I stopped to look it up. And I, I took this definition from Wikipedia, which is not just exactly the bastion of <laughs> conservatism. It says authoritarianism is a form of government characterized by the rejection of political plurality. The use of strong central power to preserve the political status quo and reductions in the rule of law, the separation of powers, and democratic voting. 
Again, I would submit to you that authoritarianism is flourishing. It's not just in our nation. It's flourishing around the world. It's a spiritual conflict. I could give you some examples from our own culture. They're the ones we know the most. I saw an interview this week with the head of the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, that's been at the center of so much in the last two years. They're restructuring and reorganizing. The, the, the director of that organization, I heard them say this week that the CDC's assignment is to make public health suggestions, that that's their role, that they don't make policy. They just make public health suggestions. Well, if that's true, somebody needs to explain it beyond there because we spent the last two years with all sorts of authority figures telling us they were just following CDC guidelines. Therefore, you had to stay home or not fly or not send your child to school or whatever. There was a huge discrepancy between what was being stated and what we watched. We have to pay attention in some different ways. Lawlessness is exploding around us intentionally ignoring laws and fomenting violence all across the spectrum. There's an un, they're unrelenting in policing certain persons or groups. Propaganda, a messaging that is not rooted in truth, but it's rooted in objective, in outcome. It's a message designed to achieve an outcome. And when it is a unified message across multiple platforms, multiple personalities, and it's unrelenting, it becomes a tool of manipulation. Not a new thing, but in the way it's being used and growing amongst us, it's a new thing. Censorship, it's a part of propaganda. You have to, you have to refuse free speech in order to allow your message to predominate the marketplace of ideas. So the common practices we see, if we don't like your speech, we'll say it's hate speech. It's disrespectful, it's inappropriate, it's misinformation, it's disinformation, a whole other set of labels. You all understand there are some things you could say in a public place or in the marketplace and the labels would be directed at you almost immediately. Now, this, The next one seems odd to me, but there, there is increasingly a lack of diversity and tolerance. Now, diversity and tolerance are the, the ideas that are championed, we're told, above all else. Unless you deviate from the messaging of the propaganda. And then we're pretty intolerant. What we're seeing increasingly is there's one way to think, one way to act, one way to treat a disease. There, there's one way to respond. And it isn't about your opinion or my opinion and a, a free exchange of ideas. We're watching them tear down statues, rewrite our history. So if you have a different opinion of the person that's represented in the statue or the part of history that's being reflected there, you need to be silenced. So while we're saying we're tolerant and we want to encourage diversity, we're becoming fiercely intolerant. We can't be reminded of positive things that someone did. We're going to focus on the part we want to focus on and you need to be quiet. One of the more intriguing places that's being reflected is in, in comedians. Comedians have made their career most of my lifetime making fun of the status quo. That's not okay anymore. It's an expression of authoritarianism. Now, it emerges when we make government our source. It emerges from idolatry on the part of God's people. God is our provider. He's our sustainer. He's our ultimate authority. We need clarity on this. We have to change our hearts. I would submit to you it's been the weakened condition of the church that's allowed this type of authoritarianism to rise as it is. So don't be angry at somebody else. Don't point an accusing finger. Don't wait for the next election. That won't fix it. It will get worse. If we don't have a change of heart in the midst of God's people, it's very important we put our hopes in the wrong places and we'll wander further into the weeds. Let's humble ourselves, turn back to God in repentance. Then I believe we can see his deliverance. Amen? Amen. Now our specific topic in this session has to do with one of the wounds that we garner in the midst of this spiritual conflict. We're going to talk about rejection and its impact upon our lives. But let's begin with the basis of our freedom, understanding why we imagine we can be free, why we can have spiritual freedom, and from that we can have liberties and freedoms that would inform our lives or our families or our children or our grandchildren. Is it because of the nation we live in or because of the Constitution or the Bill of Rights? 
Is it because we join the right church or believe in the right denomination or we read the right translation of the Bible? Those things all have value and I'm grateful for them, but they are not the basis of our freedom. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 14, it's a statement made about Jesus. It says, because by one sacrifice, he, Jesus, has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. We don't do a lot of verb studies around here because they're about as exciting as, I don't know what, watching paint dry. But the verb tenses in that verse make a difference to us. It says, by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever. That's the perfect tense. It means it's complete, it's entire, it's accomplished. There's nothing to be added to it. It's an act that is final and complete and perfect as it stands. So through Jesus' redemptive work, that is an accomplished fact. There's nothing to be added to it. But the outcome of that affects you and me. Because of what Jesus accomplished through his redemptive work on the cross, it says we are being made holy. That's the continuing present tense. That means it's not complete, that that's an ongoing thing, that we will live in that process. So to understand that, we've got to rethink a little bit the, the package in which we've received our faith. We've been encouraged to make a profession of faith. I believe in that. I believe in the new birth, conversion, salvation. But once you've done that, once you've followed it with baptism and you've begun to read your Bibles, we have to continue the process of growing up in our Lord and being transformed more completely into the image of Jesus. And I'm not sure that message has been fully received. Some of us have been a little frozen in that growth process. We've been content, satisfied, complacent, maybe even self-righteous. We'll talk about the things we believe and then look across the street at our brothers and sisters walking into another church and be critical of them because we believe a little differently than they. They read the wrong translation. I mean, after all, we're going to receive communion this morning from a plastic cup that was not distributed from a brushed aluminum tray. Do you suppose it's legitimate? We struggle with things, the things that we will fight about amongst ourselves. May I make a suggestion? If there's a point on which we could disagree and we could both still go to heaven, extend the hand of fellowship and stop making a fist. Okay? Now, there's some things you can't negotiate away. You can't you negotiate away the uniqueness of Jesus. There aren't many paths to God. Jesus said he is the, the, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. You can't negotiate away the virgin birth. You can't negotiate away his crucifixion. You can't negotiate away his resurrection. If we disagree on those points, we won't both make the same outcome. So you need to understand the difference in what's primary and what is secondary, and we have confused the two. The time of day we meet, the day of the week in which we meet, the clothing we wear to worship, those reflect personalities and preferences, and, and they may have some value in the discussion, but they're not primary. But because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, if you will choose to cooperate, you can lead a life of transformation in every season of life, at every stage of life. Because every life stage is going to bring new challenges. Those families we watched this morning, some of you know very well the challenges that come with new babies. Amen or oh me. But, but here's the, mis the mistake we often make. There's challenges that come with every life stage. I haven't found an easy season yet. Have you? It takes courage. Amen is the word you're searching for. Look at Isaiah 53 and verse six. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him. It's a messianic prophecy talking about Messiah. The Lord has laid on the Messiah, the iniquity of us all. God, Isaiah prophesied that when Messiah comes, God would place on him our iniquity. It's a biblical word. Iniquity means basically our sin and all of its consequences. That God would place upon Messiah our sin and all the consequences attached to them. That's why we are being made holy. We can be transformed. We've been set free from the evil consequences of sin. Now that's an established fact in, in heaven for time and eternity. That is established. There's no plan B. God doesn't have another idea. He's not going to circle back around and give you another option in this. What's critical for your future and my future is what we choose to believe because your believing it is what gives it authority in your life. There's only one way to receive it and that's by choosing to believe it. 
So may I make a suggestion? Quit trying to convince yourself you can be good enough to please God. You can't. Because if you offend on one rule, you're done. For the last three or four weeks, there has been a disproportionate number of tickets written on Highway 99. I am a law-abiding driver on Highway 99. But imagine if you violated one driving rule anytime. One mile an hour over the speed limit, you rolled through one stop sign, one yellow light. <laughs> imagine if one offense you could never drive. How many of you know you'd have to live closer to church? Uh, you'd have to be within bicycle distance. We'd have a bike rack. We'd have pins for horses. We'd be, run, run, we'd be running shuttles and buses, right? Because there'd be no drivers in the house. Because you understand intuitively that you're going to offend at some point, sometime. Well, the same is true. If you're trying to earn your way into the grace of God by merit-based choices, understand this, it's impossible. Because if you offend on one point, you lose. You have to believe that Jesus did something for you. And then your life is a response to that incredible gift. But it's not a response you just make one time. Our response is a, is a daily action towards the Lord. God sent his to the son to the cross because he loves us. Bible offers no explanation for that. It never attempts to tell us why God loves us. It's just one of the presentations. It's a given in the equation of scripture. We don't deserve it. We certainly didn't earn it. There's nothing in us to warrant the incredible sacrifice that was made on our behalf. God didn't make a similar sacrifice for the angels that rebelled against him. They'll spend eternity facing judgment for that choice. It was a sovereign choice of almighty God and we're the beneficiaries. Amen. Amen. Now here's the other part of the equation. It's the less happy part. We're still required to be overcomers because the conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness still fills this present world. There'll come a time when Jesus returns and he will address those who oppose him. But in the, in the moment, we live in the midst of that conflict. And when you align yourselves with the purposes of God, you inherit an adversary. You don't have to do anything. People say, I don't believe in the devil. It's okay, he believes in you. You know, Pastor, I don't know what I believe about all those unclean spirits. You don't have to know what you believe. They believe. When Jesus walked into the synagogue in Capernaum, Mark chapter 1, he hasn't begun his public ministry. Nobody knows he's the Christ. No human being yet has made any proclamations about him other than at his birth when they were in the temple. And the, uh, uh, there's a man there who's demonized. An unclean spirit in him says, I know who you are. That unclean spirit had more spiritual awareness than the rabbi in the synagogue or any of those other good people who were gathered that day to worship. So the assignment we're given biblically is to be overcomers. Look at Romans 12, 21. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. There's two options there. You're either gonna be an overcomer or you'll be overcome. Well, I don't like that. Okay, duly noted. You still have two options. Well, I wish it weren't so. Okay, I'll join you in that. You still have two options. Well, I don't know why God did that. Neither do I. You still have two options. Well, I don't know if I want to think about that. Okay, you still have two options. Have I mentioned you've got two options? You're either going to be an overcomer or you're going to be overcome. Well, life's pretty hard right now. It looks like I'm going to have to over... Uh, yeah. In fact, the last book of the New Testament. Everybody says to me, the Old Testament's so harsh. Have you read the New Testament? In Revelation chapter 2, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Who gets that right? To the one who overcomes. That's our choice. That, that it gives an imagination of perseverance, of determination, of faithfulness of a reliance upon God, of trust in him. If we go back to the language we started in Hebrews 10, 14, of this process of being made holy, you think, I think we think of holiness as something about weakness and timidity and retreating and, 
in some misty-eyed humming or chanting in the semi-dark space. That's not the presentation of holiness in Scripture. It's about a bold belief in Almighty God and a determination as Jesus taught us to pray that his kingdom would come and his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. For God's will to be done in the earth will take God's people being overcomers. So if we back to this spiritual conflict idea, Ephesians 6, 12, I took this from the message. It's a more contemporary translation, but I like the language on this because it kind of repositions our thoughts a little bit. It says, this is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. We use a lot of language around sports and competition and even business, you know, battle language and war language. Now, I never served in the military, but I have many friends and interact with people who have. And I can tell you from just listening and observing that what we do on a soccer field or a basketball court is not the same. We can go home and take a hot shower and hydrate and have some ibuprofen and most of our problems will diminish. That's not what's being described. Look at the next sentence. This is for keeps. A life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. See, when we refuse to have the courage to share our faith, to tell our story, to acknowledge a biblical worldview when we're in a public place, understand we have just conceded the arena to darkness. Our indifference, our unwillingness, our ambivalence, our timidity, whatever, whatever words you want to plug in there is a concession. It's a yielding. The encouragement, the prompting, the assignment of scripture is to recognize there's a struggle. Now, what I want to do in this session is acknowledge some of the wounds that we take, we receive as we make our way through time. Nobody's excluded. No one is excluded. Some people may handle it better than others. Some may be more adept with makeup. Some may have enough ways to deflect or to redirect. Nobody makes it through time without struggling with these challenges. And I just brought three. We looked at a couple in a previous session. We talked about guilt and shame and their impact upon us. I believe the greatest weapon Satan uses against God's people is guilt. And I don't have time to recapitulate that message. You can listen to it. It's, it's somewhere in the cloud or I don't know. Somebody smarter will help you find it. The third one, it's the one I want to focus on with our remaining time, is rejection. Rejection. It touches all of our lives. Nobody gets through without this. And it doesn't just touch our lives, it impacts how we relate with one another and relate to our world and relate to God. You need a plan for overcoming the wound. Ignoring it's not sufficient. Denying it's not adequate. The opposite of rejection would be acceptance. So what we would prefer is to be accepted, celebrated, lauded, approved. The synonyms for rejection would be things like to be excluded, the feeling of being unwanted, not really belonging, somehow being on the outside. Rejection feels like everybody else got the manual on how to do this, but they didn't give me the copy. Does life come with instructions? Then you feel like somehow other people are just better prepared. They got an advantage that wasn't given to you. It can be because of an accent, a hair color, the color of your skin, where you were educated or where you weren't. Whole host of things can feed this, but rejection is an epidemic amongst human beings. And if you don't understand it and have a plan for addressing it, it will shape your response to life and diminish what God will do through you. We can be made holy. We can be delivered from that rejection because of what our Messiah has done for us. Remember God placed on him our iniquity? All the consequences for sin, not just my sin, the consequences for sin. The redemptive work of Jesus delivers us from the consequence of sin, not just mine. It starts really early in our lives. Parents, we'd be far better served helping our children understand their spiritual freedom than trying to protect them from instances of rejection. We work really hard so they won't be put in a place where they'll suffer that. Folks, it comes with the trip. I don't want to diminish your love or your concern or your protection for your children, but they'll be better served if you will teach them spiritual principles to stay spiritually strong and spiritually clean and spiritually free. 
It'll be more beneficial if all you do is protect them. They'll lack the strength physically, emotionally, or spiritually to flourish when they find those circumstances from which you can no longer protect them. And those circumstances are coming. They're inevitable. I learned some of these things as a kid. We all do. I'm not unique. I can tell my stories. It's safer. And I'll tell them from early in my childhood because those are making me less vulnerable. I've got two brothers. And we were young. My dad was our barber. He's not trained. <laughs> you know he's a veterinarian. So he knows how to shave a dog. He knows how to shave a horse. He has clippers for that. He taught us to do that. We can do all of those things too. Well, at some point, I suppose it probably began as an economic decision. He decided he would be our barber. What a blessing. I bet he's still available if somebody's interested and you need a little number two blade. Here we go. It didn't bother me when I was a little fella. I didn't pay any attention. I thought everybody had that same barber. And I can't really tell you where it changed, but some way along that, I know I was in school by then because I got to school and everybody didn't have my barber. And some of the people I went to school with didn't appreciate my barber, but they didn't know him. They couldn't say anything to him. So they just talked to me and asked me why I cut my hair like that. Make fun of me. I didn't particularly like that. I didn't enjoy it. I wasn't quite as emotionally mature as I am today. I couldn't explain that my father was a veterinarian and he had a pair of clippers, but they only had one size blade on them and this is what worked. <laughs> so I learned a different response. I don't care what you think. It doesn't matter to me. It worked pretty well. Because if you push too hard, I'd push you back. I kept growing. Challenges keep coming with life. I like to play basketball. The, the opportunities were different back in the day. So I made the team for a couple of schools and I was not an overly gifted athlete. I was just mean. <laughs> Meanness will get you a ways in athletics. <laughs> and a lot of times I was playing against people that were more athletically gifted than I were. Oftentimes they were older than I was. They were bigger than I was. In fact, Long before I was in college, we go to MTSU and get in pickup games because it was good practice to go play with people that were more gifted. And I know it's supposed to be a non-contact sport, but the way I played, <laughs> not so much because I wasn't good enough just to beat you on sheer athleticism. I needed to leave a mark. <laughs> and what that meant was I got my share of nicks. Teeth knocked out, lips split, nose broken, eye cut, and I learned a response. That didn't hurt. That didn't hurt. Whether or not they, they knocked my teeth through my lip. I just wiped the blood and looked at it, wiped it on my jersey and smiled. That didn't hurt. May I tell you the truth? That hurt. <laughs> What kind of an idiot when you get hit hard enough that you're bleeding or there's, a, there's a, a lump emerging looks at the perpetrator and go, that was fun. That the best you got? Watch me get up. I'll hit you harder. I don't care what you think. That didn't hurt. I kept growing. I got to college. I knew what I wanted to do. I chose a profession. It was going to require graduate school. And so the undergraduate portion of that journey was all about attrition. We'll make you quit. Your classes will be early in the morning. We'll put all the tests on the same day. We will stack it to try to discourage you. My friends would come to my dorm room crying and say, some doctor so-and-so says, I'm too stupid to do this. I should quit. So what do you think my response was? I've been learning now since I won't quit. You can't make me quit. I'd go tell them. Not always politely. 
If I had to bundle all of those things into a word, it's about me bumping into rejection. And I was negotiating it apart from a biblical perspective without any help from the Spirit of God. If it hadn't been for God's supernatural intervention in my life, he sent a woman whom I had known since I was a little boy. She just happened to want to visit the college campus I was attending, and so my parents asked me if I would let her ride with me when I went back after Christmas break. And we just coincidentally had an ice storm that day, so a trip I could normally make in about nine hours took 12 or 14. And she spent that whole time quizzing me. And at the end of 12 hours, she said, I need to talk to you. And I'm thinking, lady, I just spent 12 hours in the car with you. Anything you had to say is done. <laughs> I checked her into the hotel. She said, would you be willing to pray with me for a few minutes? What's the answer to that? No, I don't want to pray with you. But I knew if I told her that, my parents would immediately materialize right there in that room. So I said, I would love to pray with you. And she said, you're filled with anger and resentment and hatred. And I said, you know, you're right, but I need those things. They give me the edge. Helps me stay up late. If I gave those things up, I'd feel really vulnerable. And she said, well, you can't hold those things and imagine that you can serve the Lord. You see, we can't remove ourselves from the unfairness and the injustice and the challenges and the hurdles of life. You can't do that. You can learn responses. You can learn to compensate. You can learn to cope. You can build walls and shells and all sorts of things. And God, in God's great mercy and that person's determination, she spent a couple hours with me, helping me, first of all, be willing to repent and then to release those things so that I could be free. See, those people weren't burdened because of my resentment. I was. If I hadn't had that session, if I hadn't had that gift, I would have a completely different career today that had nothing to do with God's purpose for my life. My anger and resentment would have tied me to that pathway. Spiritual wounds, they're real. Their outcomes are real. In fact, I want to suggest something here that we have to value what God says about us more than our desired outcomes. See, so often we know what we want, and anyone or anything that opposes what we want, we perceive of as the enemy. God had a different plan for my life. I know that now. I didn't know that then. And I, I had to be willing to, in obedience, do the things I knew to do, forgive, repent of my anger and resentment, turn loose of those things, release those people from the imagination that they owed me something. You see, you have the imagination that someone in your life, some relationship should be some way, should behave in some specific way. And when they don't, you're angry, you're resentful, you're embittered, and you're not turning loose of that until they become what you want them to be. I want to suggest a different pathway. What if you said to the Lord, I release them for meeting my expectations. I want to please you. I want to please you. We spend too much energy, physically, emotionally, and otherwise, trying to cause other people to become who we want them to be and what we want them to be, while we miss what God has for us. Rejection. I made up my mind before I started this, I'm, we're not going to finish this topic in this session. So what I don't do here, we'll do next, God willing. But let's start with this idea, and it's the value that God attaches to you. While you're demanding your way, while you want a relationship, an outcome, an objective, uh, a life achievement, and, and you see the people between you and that as bullies, intimidating, withholding, the, the seed of evil, your outcome is being threatened. I want to ask you if you'll have the courage to believe what God has said about you. 
In Romans 15 and verse seven, it says, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. Christ accepted you. The creator of heaven and earth has accepted you. Yeah, but this person, the creator of heaven and earth has accepted you. Look at the next verse. It's Ephesians 2. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You're God's workmanship. God doesn't make junk. Yeah, but I wanted to have the physical skills of a professional athlete. I'm God's workmanship. But I wanted, I'm God's workmanship. You see, a part of overcoming in the spiritual conflict is being willing to yield my will, my demand, my expectation. So many of the wounds I accumulate come in that conflict between the demands of my carnal nature and the reality of this broken world in which I live. I'm God's workmanship. God said you're fearfully and wonderfully made. Try that one on in front of the mirror. While you're analyzing all the things that aren't right, what can you have fixed? The calendar's attacking your body. If that doesn't mean anything to you, just wait. It's coming for you. I'm God's workmanship all the way through my journey in time at every season of life, created in Christ Jesus to do good works for him. God prepared them in advance before I drew my first breath, before my parents assigned a name to me. Before I went to first grade, God had plans for your life. Stand a little taller. Look at Psalm 68. God sets the lonely in families. God sets the lonely in families. That's translated a handful of ways. Hebrew is an old language. There's some ambiguity in it sometimes when we pull it forward, but the essence is God does not leave you alone. God does not leave you desperate and alone. He'll place you in community. And then some of you say, yeah, but look at the family he placed me in. Folks, every family tree has a few fruits and nuts. <laughs> God sets the lonely in families. He leads forth the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. Don't rebel against God. Don't rebel against God. You have to value what God says about you more than you demand your way. You see, when you're demanding your way, standing in your selfishness, you're just adding a multiplier. You're, you're adding a momentum to those spiritual attacks against you. Choose to align yourself by your belief, by your yielding to the authority of God with what God has said about you. This is not new to us. I, th I think it's epidemic proportion in, in our current culture. Uh, but I don't think it's a new thing. In fact, I, I spent some time in these last few days just reflecting on, on my heroes in Scripture and what they had to overcome. In Exodus chapter 2, this is Moses. And I, I'm going to tell you what my objective is in reading this. I, I want to do anything I can to encourage you to overcome the attitude of a victim. It's so prevalent. I've been mistreated. Someone has not done right by me. Folks, yes. That's it. That's what it means to be alive under the sun. <coughs> now here's the question. What are we going to do with that? From whom are we demanding recompense? Where do we imagine the resolutions coming from? The government? A policy? A law? A counselor? Or God? That attitude is settled so deeply over us and so deeply within us as if it's never happened before. You see, the, the people that are perpetrating it and understand it is being perpetrated are trying to make you believe you're unique, that no one else has ever felt like that. That what you're enduring is almost entirely without historical perspective, that, that somehow you've been singled out for this unfair, unfortunate thing. 
When in reality, it's the nature of the journey. It's like your ears popping when you fly. Doesn't mean you're going deaf. It means you're on a plane changing altitude. Doesn't mean your ears are wrong. You don't need an ENT. You need to learn how to clear your ears. We need to learn how to be clean. We need to learn how to cooperate with the Holy Spirit so that we can be more completely transformed into the image of Christ, that we can learn how to lead more holy lives, not more passive lives, not more withdrawn lives. We've been holding the wrong people, the wrong things accountable. Look in Exodus chapter two, Moses, pretty supernatural character. Moses is a young man. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were. Moses' parents abandoned him in a river. You can come with your fancy explanations, but that's the short course. No, they didn't kill him when he was born. They just abandoned him in the river. And he grows up with his ethnicity being hidden, being treated as if he's a part of Pharaoh's household. So he's included amongst the household of those who are abusing, enslaving his own people, and they ask him to hide his ethnicity. That could leave you a bit torqued, you think? He went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their labor, their hard labor. And he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. So he looked around, see if anybody was watching, and he killed the Egyptian. Hid the body. And the next day he went out to see two, two Hebrews fighting. And he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? He has a compassion for his people. Now watch the answer. Who made you ruler and judge over us? Just who do you think you are? Well, now that you ask, I'm the one that risked his entire future interceding on your behalf yesterday. You ingrate. I put the entire story of my existence at risk standing up for you. No thank you. No gratitude, no appreciation, no applause. Who made you ruler over us? Does that feel like rejection to you? It does me. Moses has to run for his life. Not only did his best attempt to do the right thing not get a good outcome, it cost him everything. He lost his pension. He lost his health care. He lost his home. He lost every relationship. He lost everything. The only thing he escaped with was his life. You think, yeah, but it worked out okay. Yeah, it, it did. But that experience is repeated over and over. I could do, we could fill pages with the repetition of that in Moses' life. I brought you one example, Numbers 12. Miriam and Aaron, they're his family. They share DNA, began to talk against Moses. Now, by this point, they're way out of Egypt. Red Sea's been parted. They've had water from the rock. They're chewing on manna. They got manna stuck in their teeth. They eat quail because they wanted a, a little variety in their diet. Moses has gone up the mountain and come back down with the Ten Commandments. He glows in the dark. He spends so much time with the Lord. God talks to him face to face. And Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because they didn't like his wife. That's what it says. And their question was, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? And he's spoken through us too. Does that feel like rejection to you? Who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? It's not unique to Moses. It went throughout his life. Some of you prefer Samuel. We've been reading these chapters in our daily Bible reading. Samuel is the last of the judges. He's a prophet, but he's the last of the leaders of Israel. When it's a theocracy, when God oversees the nation, they had no central government. They had no capital city. There was no king. There was no monarch over them. It was a theocracy. God watched over his people. And as long as they chose to honor the Lord, he protected them. They prospered under his guidance. And the leaders, the tribal leaders, come to Samuel. 
He's an old man by this time. You'd be a little more vulnerable to this kind of banter in this season of your life. All the elders of Israel gathered together and they came to Samuel and they said to him, you're old. Well, geez, that feels like ageism to me. He probably looked at him and said, and you're ugly, so okay. He said, you're old and your sons don't walk in your ways. You're not only old, you're a bad parent. You haven't watched over your household well. He spent his life serving these people. Now appoint a king to lead us. We want to be like the other nations. It says, when they said, give us a king to lead us, it displeased Samuel. No kidding. The Bible has a gift of understatement. He wanted to slap them in the next week. I mean, in a God-honoring kind of a way. This displeased Samuel, so he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you they've rejected. They've rejected me. You know what disobedience to the Lord is fundamentally? We reject him. We don't want your authority. We don't want your intrusion. I don't want your opinion. I don't care what you think. Samuel, they didn't reject you. They rejected me. Well, he has to tell, you know why he has to tell Samuel that? Because Samuel's certain he's the one that's being rejected. He's confident. God does a work in Samuel's heart. He anoints the next kings, not just the first one. He anoints the one after that. I think that might have been a little awkward to have to go to anoint Saul, stand him in front of the people and say, this is the man God's chosen to lead you. They still need Samuel's wisdom, his attentiveness to the Lord, his willingness to follow the Spirit of God to secure their future. Now, I want to give you the remedy. i got two minutes, and then we're going to take communion together. Look at Isaiah 53. Jesus has intervened on our behalf. We'll pick this up later, I promise. It says, he was despised. This is the Messiah. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Remember what we read earlier? Our iniquities were placed on him. Now Isaiah begins to break them out with some specificity. The consequences of sin. He was rejected. He understood sorrow. He understood suffering. You'll understand those things. They will touch your life. But they're not wounds that have to flourish and fester and shape your future. You can be healed. God, I forgive. I release. I set them free. Doesn't mean you have to get back in line for further abuse. But don't carry that. Why? Why is more complex than we have time for in this moment? Jesus took those consequences. Acts chapter 2. It's the day of Pentecost. Peter's talking to the crowd in Jerusalem. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man accredited by God to you. Miracles, wonders, and signs God did among you. You know this, that they who's handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. God handed him over to you. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Jesus took our rejection. The people that should have accepted him, all he did was do miracles and raise the dead and open blind eyes. The sinless, obedient son of God. And we rejected him. We wanted nothing to do with him. We crucified him. He took our rejection. That we could be accepted. Jesus in Psalm 22, these these are the words Jesus quotes when he's on the cross, but it came from the Psalms. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He said it in Aramaic and it's translated in, in two of the gospels, but why are you so far from saving me? So far from the words of my groaning. Jesus suffered rejection that you and I can be accepted by almighty God. By Almighty God. 
Why do people have to be mean? Why does life have to be cruel? Folks, we're in a battle. That means by definition, it's not fair. If you're fighting fair, the outcome doesn't mean much. That's athletics. In athletics, you have to win or lose. If it's a real battle, you just need to learn to win. Hebrews 10, 14 is where we started because by one sacrifice, he's made perfect forever those who are being made holy. I gave you a prayer. We might as well pray it together and then we'll do communion. I really am going to quit. You'll want to take this prayer with you. One, one reading of this will not more than likely land you in the place where you want to stay. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to see the times and places where you've suffered rejection. You'll know some of them. And then to begin to identify your responses, the resentment or the anger or the desire for someone else to change or the certainty that it, it's, the remedy is beyond you. Folks, don't give that away. God, I trust you to work your purposes in my life. I trust you to work your purposes in my life. I want to be obedient to you. Forgiveness isn't an emotion. It's a decision. Forgiveness does not mean that the other person gets away with it. I trust God. He's just. Your willingness to forgive is about you and the outcomes of your life. It untethers you from the event or the events. It sets you free. Resentment keeps you grounded in that place. Reliving it over and over and over again. Bitterness and hatred, you just can't afford them. Let's read this prayer together. God, I thank you that you loved me, that you gave Jesus, your son, to die on my behalf, that he bore my sins, that he took my rejection, that he took my penalty, because I come to you through him. I am not unwanted. I am not excluded. I belong to the family of God. I belong to the best family in the universe. Heaven is my home, and I thank you today. Amen. Now, you've got the communion elements, I hope, with you. If you didn't, when you came in, the ushers will be in the aisles. They'll give them with you. If you're at home, you're watching this, you go grab your cup of milk. Hope you didn't eat all the Oreos. See, the basis for that kind of a proclamation or prayer is what Jesus did for us through his substitutionary death on the cross. He exhausted the curse of sin that we might receive all the blessings due his perfect obedience. That's why we take communion together. It's not just a ritual or a tradition or something to, be, to fill time in a worship service. If you need communion, you can raise a hand. The ushers are in the aisles. They'll help you with that. Jesus himself put this in place. It didn't begin with a pastor or a denomination. You have to peel back that cellophane lid to get to that wafer. I used to say that if there was sin in your life, you couldn't open it. And then one Sunday in front of everybody, guess what? And the cameraman zeroed in on it. I still meet people that ask me why I couldn't get the communion open. Jesus celebrated the Passover with the disciples, and at the end of that meal, he took bread and he broke it, and he said, this bread is my body, broken for you as often as you eat this. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive together. And then he took a cup, and he said, this cup is a new covenant, a new contract, sealed with my own blood. As often as you drink this, you do it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. You bow with me in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word and its truth and power and authority in our lives. I thank you that in your great love for us, you sent your son. Lord, to, be, to walk amongst us, to show us a new way. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for your great obedience and enduring the cross. We praise you today that you bore the consequences of our iniquity, that we might be set free. 
And Lord, we come by decision of our will today to forgive, to release, to cancel all those debts that we've imagined that we were owed. Different responses, different outcomes, different words. We release them today. And Lord, as we release those, I thank you that you have forgiven us, that you have accepted us, that you love us, that you care for us, that you have a plan for our good, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you look at us and derive great pleasure, that you have a plan for our future with you. We thank you for it today. I thank you for the freedom that has begun this day, for the healing that has begun this day, for the liberty that has begun this day. We receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content and we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.